Ah, oh, jeez. Okay. Is this thing still working? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. All right, yep. Look, I'll be honest with you here. I've never been a huge fan of John claude Van Damme films, especially the um, late 80s to early 90s work that people mostly remember him by. Just so we're clear, it's, it's not the actor I have a problem with. Now, you can say what you want about the silly plot or cheesy dialogue, but to me, it's actually the action scenes that are the biggest letdown for me. Some of these action scenes can be a bit too comical, like the final fight from Kickboxer. Too obviously choreographed, like the one fight against the big tall Asian dude and the leapfrogging black dude from Bloodsport. Bruh. Or it can also be down to the slow motion in unnecessary times. Compared to John Woo films when there are slow motion scenes of pain, death or explosions, here it's just long acrobatics or attacks that aren't really that painful. They're nice to look at, sure, but to me it can really slow down the pace of the action scene too much. Before I go any further, I'd just like to say, the films aren't terrible, but they just end up being average. But there was one film he did in the early days that was, while an average film for me, it came so close to being something really special. That was Death Warrant. Released in September of 1990, towards the later end of the early Van Damme era, I'd say Universal Soldier or Hard Target onwards was when things got better for me at least. I'll summarise most of the plot for you. Police detective Lewis Burke goes into a prison facility in California as an undercover cop in order to find out who was behind a mysterious series of murders and finds himself locked up with his nemesis, Christian Naylor, a psychotic serial killer who calls himself The Sandman who sets out to exact revenge on him for stopping his spree 16 months ago. The plot unfolds and we discover an organ harvesting conspiracy that the doctors, prison guards, and some prisoners are involved in. How can I describe the frustrating potential of this film? There are a few good points in this film, but they weren't developed enough or used enough. The film wanted to be more than what it looked like, and you can definitely tell. Let me show you what I mean. Let's start with the introductory sequence because it's probably the best part of the film. You'll understand why. We start 16 months before the main story, when the Sandman was still on the loose. Burke arrives at an abandoned building, about to go in, when some gang members try to pick a fight. He fights them off, but it's nothing acrobatic. No slow motion either. It seems normal, but this is where things take a complete 180. A very dark location. Minimal lighting. A few seconds later, Burke discovers a dead body. It's so quiet, only the tiniest of objects make noise. Score is kept to a minimum. There's a few eyeline matches here as he approaches a closet door. When he opens it, he aims at an old baby doll. Again, cuts to and from his point of view. You know what this reminds me of? Works from Hitchcock. His films occasionally cut back and forth from a character to their point of view. Could be a semiotic for foreshadowing or an immediate shocking image. So yes, I've just compared the works of Hitchcock to a John claude Van Damme film. I mean, who's the real psychopath here, me or the Sandman? Anyway, after that, the film does something I did not expect. <laughs> Good lord! When I first saw that, I actually jumped! Burke looks really terrified here. He shoots the Sandman multiple times, but he can take it because he's that much of a monster. But he eventually falls to the floor in the end, supposedly dead. You're under arrest. Well... Let's just recap what we just saw. That was unexpectedly chilling and suspenseful. So we have the suspense, a sense of fear and vulnerability in the characters, a terrifying villain, and a jump scare. These four things stood out immediately as strengths in my opinion. But did this film use these strengths to its advantage? Well, let's find out. Let's start with suspense. Remember those eyeline matches or point of view shots as a whole? There's quite a few. In crowded areas, we don't know who's friend or foe. In dangerous battles, we don't know what will pop out at us. Sometimes the point of view happens before the character we're viewing from is established, bringing some more uncertainty. The film makes good use of big close-ups on objects that can cause harm or any sense of danger. Uncomfortable to look at in a way, a bit too close to the viewer. 
The film also uses tilted angles a lot in prison. It makes the environment uneasy. It's used more and more as the plot develops, the more you realise how messed up things really are in the prison. So that's one good point used well. Next up, fear and vulnerability. Oh. Jesus, grab him! What the? The worst thing you can make an action hero become is too invincible. In this film, Burke is cut up, stripped naked and locked up. Corridors and cells are too confined for Burke to make enough escapes or effective attacks. During one time he made an escape from something, he manages to cut himself, almost exposing him. So despite his acrobatic skills, it's never guaranteed that he's in the clear and he sure as hell couldn't have succeeded on his own. Another character who shows a great sense of fear and vulnerability is Myerson. He gets more nervous and agitated the more Burke pushes for information, de-stressing himself with a cigarette. Gets to breaking point when he knows he's about to die. Don't, no, no! I swear to God, I didn't do it! Stop! What do you want me to do? I'll give you anything when you want! Stop it, you! Oh! Oh, help me! Nobody! No! Man! Well, damn. The acting is pretty good in this film. Next, the villain. Time to go to sleep and join your old partner. Let's analyze the Sandman visually and physically. He's much taller than Burke. His smile is wider than a normal one. That is a Joker smile. His hair is scruffy, to say the least, implying the further instability of the man. This next part will be a bit hard to explain. There's something uncanny in the shape of his face. Facial structure above the eyes, on the eyebrows, seems a bit extended out. It's like he's wearing a layer of someone else's skin. Looks too thick to be normal. Needless to say, the casting for the Sandman was perfect. You couldn't pick a better actor. The final fight is really good. It introduces another physical trait of the Sandman. Other than withstanding many bullets, he can also attack out of nowhere but disappear moments after. Really slippery. So half the time we don't know where he's hiding. Because of the film's good use of point of view shots, one can easily assume some of these shots from Burke from behind platforms, rails and pipes are from the viewpoint of the Sandman himself. Even towards the end of the fight, he goes to insane lengths to demonstrate his near invincibility. Like surviving being burnt alive and getting impaled in the back of the head and still talking. Can't kill me, Burke. I'm the Sandman. <laughs> it's actually a more fitting end than you think. All of the victims of the conspiracy had been spiked in the head. Seems fitting that the bad guy goes the same way. Someone who actually deserves it. Now, here are the bad points. He is absurdly underdeveloped. He's a serial killer, sure. A scary one at that but it would make him more intimidating if he got more background information. Not even a kill count or signature motive on each death. He's just a killer. The film is only 85 minutes long on PAL view. That really isn't much. Could have had more time to flesh out the character. He returns about 55 minutes in, but his return is completely undervalued because of the plot setup that made his return in the first place. The other bad guy, Attorney General Tom Vogler, who runs the organ harvesting conspiracy, simply transferred the Sandman to the film's prison because Burke was hard to kill. So, he's a pawn. He's being used. Look at this guy! He's too intimidating to deserve such undervalued importance. If he had some sort of vital role in the conspiracy, like being the one finding and butchering donors, his return would be much more important. Given the high expectations at the start, his importance just drops completely. Also, the other bad guy just disappears from the film when he's caught. We, the viewer, just have to assume that he was arrested and held accountable. Now, whether he's actually seen cuffed up or if it's some sort of cheesy newspaper headline that just shows up on screen, I would have preferred to have actually seen this happen. Hell, he's more of a developed character than the Sandman. And lastly, jump scares. That one at the start was really the only one. There are times when it looks like it could get scary, because the film can get really dark in terms of lighting, and the film does make good use of lighting techniques, like silhouettes and certain light blocking practices. But it doesn't push a horror element enough. We're never intrigued of what's hiding in the dark. Since there are a large number of enemies to be made, and a fair amount of opportunities for an ambush of some kind, it seems like wasted potential. 
There's one more Sandman ambush, but it's just not as frightening. <laughs> okay, so those are the four potential strengths analyzed, but what do I think of the rest of the film? Let's start with the good points. Remember when I said there was an overuse of slow motion in some Van Damme fights? There's not much of it here. The pacing of these scenes is good, and the fight choreography is great. Yeah, some people may fall for the same attack more than once, but I'll let it slide. The prison cast is quite diverse. You got white, black, Hispanic, and Asians in terms of race. There's also trans people in there, and they're not added for comical reasons. Behavior isn't over-exaggerated or overly stereotypical to the point of offense in this day and age. There's even a dwarf for good measure. Besides race and sexuality, the overall looks of people can make a difference too. To elaborate, this character, Hawkins, was in for murder, but he doesn't look menacing. You feel assured that Burke is safe around him. But then you get the more dangerous and unhinged inmates, and then you start to feel worried that Burke is in danger. They look like serial killers, probably butchered and mutilated their victims as well. Go ahead, dust him. Blow his fucking head off! Not only looks, but also their voices and emotions support this too. Outside of twist characters, if the film wants you to know that a certain character is a bad guy, that character will show it effectively. I've said it before, the acting is good in this film. Now here are the bad points. This is the part I love. The conspiracy is bare bones. It could have been a bit more fleshed out. We know what the conspiracy is and why it's happening, but I want to know more. Who are the buyers? How much are they making? And is the money being made put into other investments, political or personal benefit? Next, the romance seems forced and added context makes it even worse. Before this, our female companion Beckett gets strip searched by corrupt cops. She's obviously a bit scarred from it, but then Burke comes in and makes advances of his own, yet somehow... it works? So beautiful. Of course Burke doesn't know of the strip search, but we the viewer do, and it just comes off as... wrong. But still, I find it quite funny that he actually managed to pull it off. Old action heroes just never cease to amaze me. Furthermore, the comedy is done too intentionally. Like Commando, which I've talked about in a previous video, most of these 80s action classics are funny in their own ridiculousness or cheesiness. The famous quotes and one-liners are supposed to sound cool, but can end up being funny. But if you're not trying to be cool in an action film and just trying to be funny, it's more obvious on the intent. The comedy comes off as silly PG-rated humour unsuited for a very suspenseful action film rated 18 by the BBFC. One more nitpicky point is this. Most of the film's slowed down footage isn't taken from a slow motion camera. There could have been an artistic choice behind it, but it's not for me. It feels immoral and unpolished. It's like when someone re-uploads a video in the wrong frame rate and forgets to disable the resample so you see those interlapping frames. It's just wrong. But then they decide to use a real slow motion camera towards the end of the film. Cool and all, but why was this not used in the previous scenes? Budget restraints? The budget was only 6 million. In the end, the film ends up just being... average. I know the 5 star rating system is a bit overused, but I'd say this film is worthy of like... Two stars. It has many redeeming qualities to stand out, but many faults to hold the film back. If they pushed more of the potential strengths that I mentioned, it definitely would have been a three minimum. If the film had more runtime to flesh out the story, like more background information on the Sandman, the conspiracy, and an actual outcome for Vogler, it could have been higher than three stars, who knows? Not sure how much film you can make with a budget of six million dollars in 1990. Maybe the film could have benefited with a bigger budget? Obviously nothing too mental, but you know, a little bit more. Obviously, not a lot of people here are household names, to say the least. Could be newcomers, actors who are just generally not well known, or actors who were big back in the day, but probably not now. Some of the cast went on to do greater things after the film's release. I'll give you a few examples. Robert Guillaume, who played Hawkins, but also played Benson in a 70s show called Soap, went on to play Rafiki in The Lion King and Eli in Half-Life 2. Patrick Kilpatrick, stage name, went on to play more bad guys in big blockbusters such as Eraser and Minority Report. Even after the film's release, you would think that Jean-Claude Van Damme was the most famous and successful person to have worked on this film, right? Well, maybe not. You see, 
one person that did remarkably well afterwards was its writer, David S. Goyle. This was his first script to be made into a film. Now, the name may not sound familiar, but its other works might be recognizable. I'll list a few, including some that he co-wrote or wrote the basis of the story. <clears throat> Blade Trilogy, Dark Knight Trilogy, Call of Duty, Black Ops 1, 2, and Cold War, Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman, and Terminator Dark Fate. Well damn! Good on him! I think there's one thing we can take from this video. Sometimes potential in your own art is hard to see, even if you're the creator. So I'll say this, try looking at your own art from another perspective or another genre. You may find that there is potential hidden in certain areas, and once you find it, try pushing forward with it and see what happens. And with that being said, I'm out of here. Ow! Ow! Jeez! Oh, you know, YouTube doesn't pay me enough for this stuff. God damn. Well, at least he's not a necrophile.